Hi everyone and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. We're glad to have you with us today for our presentation featuring expert Ben Stock, Director of Healthcare Product Management of Order, as he explores simplifying the overwhelming task of keeping connected medical devices protected. Webinar Wednesday would like to thank our sponsor, Order. Order is focused on making connected device security simple through their zero-touch agentless deployment, one common platform for multiple stakeholders, and automation of policies to secure devices. With Order, you will know exactly what's connected to the network in real time, all the time. You will know what's vulnerable, what's behaving maliciously, and why. You can then automate response for any connected device and enforce on any network and any security infrastructure. Please visit order.net for more information. A few announcements before we get started. Don't miss our 20th anniversary celebration at MD Expo in just two weeks. MD Expo strives to provide healthcare technology management professionals with a unique, intimate, and rewarding conference second to none. You can find all the details and registration at mdexposhow.com. We will hold a live Q&A at the end of today's webinar. If you would like to ask a question, please use the questions feature on the webinar dashboard. We'll get to as many attendee questions as time allows. As I mentioned earlier, our speaker today is Ben Stock. Ben, you may begin whenever you are ready. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, and uh, the, the MD Expo, I will be there. So if uh, you, know, you like anything here or don't like anything here, feel free to, uh, to stop by and, and, and we can chat about it. Uh, look, I, I, it's been wonderful uh, being able to see people in person again. Uh, and I look forward to seeing anyone that's able to make it down to MD Expo Atlanta. So let's get started. Um, I, I, you know, everybody talks, you know, securing medical devices is the big thing now, and it's been big for a while. Um, and, and it seems to be that everybody has their own magic sauce to do it, and, and everybody has the, uh, you know, the ability to make it complicated. Um, but when it really comes down to it, medical devices and, and the way they communicate is, is relatively simple. Uh, they can tend to do the same things um, over and over again, um, and, and that allows us to be able to protect them by only allowing them to do those things. Um, and, you know, we hear the common word zero trust and uh, network access control and stuff like that. Um, but when it really comes down to it, the, the, the simple thing is we're just saying do these things and only do these things. So when we look at that, there's some steps we need to take to get to that. And I realize I was muted that entire time, so I apologize. Let's start over. Um, thank you all very much for joining me today. Um, my... Uh, uh, I, I look forward to MD Expo. I'm going to be there, and uh, anyone that is attending, I'd love to hear from you in person. Uh, I'm really happy we're getting back to be able to see everybody and, and have these great events um, that have been kind of hindered um, by events in the world, and uh, I look forward to seeing everyone. Um, and when we talk about medical device security, um, it is very important to understand that, uh, you know, we, we, we've kind of overcomplicated this, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, we've looked at a very, the sky is falling approach to, uh, to medical device security. And when we break it down, it's, it's pretty simple. Medical devices are designed to do one thing um, and they should only do that one thing. And we can leverage that to make sure that that's all they do using tools that, that our IT uh, infrastructure should already have in place. Um, you, you know, the, the buzzwords of zero segmentation, network access controls, firewalls. Um, if we can supply them with the right amount of information, we can really reduce that risk fingerprint for those devices. The, uh, the problem isn't getting any smaller. Um, the, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we have uh, an ex expanse of new medical devices being connected. Um, we saw this when um, the government put a real large emphasis on electronic health record. Um, and, and the industry figured out that if we connect more devices, it's less work and the information going into the electronic health record is more accurate um, because it's not being entered by humans. So we saw an explosion of devices that are now connected to the network, things we never thought we would see connected before, hospital beds for weight, um, things like that that just, you know, 
10 years ago, we would have never thought were connected to our networks. And we're going to see this continue to grow. Um, you know, we're looking at 50 billion medical devices will be connected, uh, you know, over the next decade. And, and the expansion is over 25.9% increase from the year 21, uh, 2021 to 2028 is what we're expecting. And every time we put a device on the network, we increase the risk of that device being compromised. Um, so that is important as we're doing this to not only look at the devices and understand, you know, what that security looks like for them when we're making the purchase and then after the fact, um, because we're, we're looking at a, a security, a device that we're purchasing with the intent to keep it for five to 10 years. Um, but, you know, the, the operating systems that they run on aren't intended to um, to last that long. They're, they're intended to be upgraded in sunset on a three to five year schedule um, where the medical device is going to be around a lot longer. So to simplify it, we're looking at a we're looking at taking a three tier approach to this. C, no, secure. When we say C, C, C means lots of different things to different people, but it's it's knowing what you have um, that is connected to the network. Um, we find that when we come into organizations and we implement a, a system to find it, um, there usually there's about 20 percent of devices that they think they have that aren't there, and 15 to 20 percent of devices that are there that they didn't know they had. So it's very important to know what's connected because in the end, you're responsible for every device that's connected to your network, every device that, that is connected to a patient, whether you know it's there or not. And then know, knowing about those devices, know what vulnerabilities are out there, know what risks and exploits are available for those devices, uh, and then know about the behavior of those devices. So knowing what your device is supposed to do monitoring what that is and then you know being able to react if that device it, it acts outside of its known behavior and then secure look using the tools that we have already available to us to secure the devices because the manufacturers once they stop supporting the device are no longer going to upgrade the operating system they're no longer going to be able to provide additional support for devices that are no longer supported by the operating system manufacturer So we'll start with C. How, how do we figure out everything we have and, and, and where it is and, and what it is? Um, there's a couple ways we can go about doing this. Um, one of those is, is there's companies out there that will come in and, and perform inventories. Uh, they'll physically go around your building and look for every connected device. They'll, they'll get on the CT, the MRI, put it into service mode, pull the information that you want, that you need about, you know, the operating system, what version of software that particular device is running, uh, the MAC address, IP address, your, your, your um, AE titles, all that information for you. Um, and, and they're, you know, they're good services. They're, they do this all the time. They're very good at what they do. Um, the, the good thing about this is it's relatively quick. You're going to get a, a, a solid inventory and, and the time period allotted for them to be there, usually a week to two weeks. Uh, it's a one-time expense. You know, you're not paying an additional service fee every month for this information. And in the big scheme of things, uh, overall, it's pretty inexpensive to gather this information. Um, the, the, one of the downfalls for this process, though, is that it's inaccurate the next day. So the one day you come in, you, you collect your information, uh, the next day GE comes in, Phillips comes in behind you and upgrades that software version on that device and your information is no longer accurate. Um, if you're using DHCP, which is becoming more and more commonplace with fleet medical devices where it wasn't years ago, um, you know, that IP address is only good for a certain length of time and it's going to refresh and get a new IP address. So that can't accurately be captured. Um, and even though they're very good at what they do, they, this is intrusive. You're taking the piece of equipment down uh, and you're, you're taking it down maybe within service hours or in the evening um, and you're taking away from time that that device can be used uh, or, or, you know, being intrusive by going into patient rooms. The next option would be automated. So there's many different services outside of order and others that go out on your network and they look at all the devices that are out there. Uh, they, they use tools that you have within your environment, proprietary tools, deep packet inspection, um, you know, understanding the protocols that the, the individual man, manufacturers use for their devices to help identify the devices. Um, the, the pros of this is it's very quick. You know, you put it on the network, you can expect good data within 24 hours and, and over time your data is just going to increase in fidelity. 
um, you get real-time updates. So those devices that are that are getting new IP addresses, um, that information is going to be accurate when you come and look at it. When manufacturers come in and do upgrades, you're going to get new information within your system to get to, to understand what is going on. Um, you know, and some of these systems can also help protect uh, the devices uh, through different methods. Uh, and then with this, you get the added benefit of if anything new shows up, you're going to know about it pretty quickly. Um, the cons of this is this, these kind of systems can be expensive. They're an ongoing and expense, and they have to be budgeted for, and they have to get your organization to understand why it is important to spend money in these areas and why it is important security for you to have a, a very good picture of what's going on uh, within your environment. Um, and they can sometimes, you know, they can have, they need an administrator. They need someone, not, not a sole person, not a full-time job, but someone to take care of them and make sure that everything's working properly. Then the last one is to use what you have. Um, you know, put together a process that during your PM cycles, you gather this information. Um, and and this, this is a good way to do it, but it takes time. You know, some devices you see once a year, some devices nowadays you only see every two years uh, when you're looking at some of the new infusion pump stuff. Um, so gathering it could take a lot of time and it can be uh, intrusive to you know, taking that equipment down when you're a little bit more length of time. Um, and it takes away from time that your technicians truly need to do their daily work. So that's to see. Um, no, there's, there's going to be a couple slides on no. There's lots of things we need to know. We need to understand our risks. And, and risks are, are very complicated because uh, within HTM clinical engineering, we, we understand clinical risk. We've been doing clinical risk for a long time. We understand the risk to the patient, the risk to the physician, uh, the risk to the nurses that are using the equipment. Um, but we, what we struggle with is, is the, the newer things, the, the cyber risk. You know, what on this device is creating the risk? You know, is, is it, uh, you know, is it use? Is it someone coming from the outside world and affecting the device? Uh, or is it, you know, the fact that if this device isn't on the network, it cannot function um, the way it was intended and deliver the care that it was intended. And then another one that we really focus on is that PHI exposure risk, um, understanding um, what the device has on it. If it has patient health information on it, if it's transmitting patient health information, and if it's transmitting or storing it, is that information encrypted at rest and in transit? Um, this is all very important information to have if you do have an, an event um, where you could have a PHI exposure event, um, if you can prove that the, 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 that the information was encrypted at rest, it's a lot less of an event than if you have unencrypted data out there in the world. Um, the in investigation is going to go a lot longer. Um, the government's actually rewarding, um, you know, organizations that can prove they followed the NIST standards uh, as far as security goes, and they are taking that into account if an event could happen. So being proactive and having this information and following proper standards uh, can truly help your organization if the, uh, you know, the inevitable happens and PHI is exposed. So some of those, the key information we talked about is part of the no as well. You know, it, it, the, the IP address and the MAC address, it's all pretty basic information. Um, but knowing, you know, the manufacturer and, and the model is something we've done within our CMS systems for years but then being able to associate it with the actual software version and, and an operating system version. Um, if, if you are dealing with DHCP, the, the actual current IP address, not, uh, you know, that it could be refreshing depending on, on what your, your cycle is for that. Um, the host name, I, uh, AE title, things along those lines um, that we may not have captured very well before. Um, and then we look at the risk that we talked about a second ago, knowing what your risk is and not only knowing, you know, what it is for that device overall, but knowing why it's risky is, are we seeing communication from that device internally, externally that is risky uh, and really being able to understand that risk totally. And then also when it comes to how it's connecting, you know, what it's connecting to, what port it's connecting to, if it's wireless, what access point it's using to connect to. These are very good things for security and for troubleshooting uh, and information we typically had to go and ask uh, other departments for um, to make sure that we have the most current information. And then knowing not, not only what it's communicating with, but how it's communicating, knowing the protocols that it's using, the, all the devices it's, it's communicating with, the, the ports, um, and protocols that are being used for every communication, every time when they first saw that communication, when it's the last time we saw this communication, if data was exchanged, 
um, is your firewall doing its job? The device may be trying to communicate out, but your firewall is saying, nope, we can't go out and you can't let anything back in from that particular source. All this information is extremely important when we're talking about security and then the future of securing devices by profiling what they're doing and building uh, security measures around what they're supposed to be doing. And then when we talk about security, um, there, the, there's three major areas we focus on with security. Um, proactive, you know, looking at the device, looking at the vulnerabilities, doing everything we can to alleviate those, working with the manufacturer to get the latest patches, getting your systems upgraded to a, a, a supported operating system if that's possible. But if it's not, looking at other solutions, zero trust, NAC, least privilege, to really reduce the risk footprint for that device to where it's acceptable for what the organization is looking for. Reactive security, when something is actually happening, being able to take action and, and, and stop the event, uh, the sooner you can stop the event, the sooner you can start recovering. Um, you know, with ransomware, this is huge these days. If you can't stop the event, you can't start the recovery process. Um, so being able to see where that activity is happening and, and isolate it quickly is, is minutes can save you so much money on a ransomware attack if you're able to isolate the event. And then retrospective, the events already occurred, but what was the extent of the event? Being able to go back and look at what devices communicated with what protocols to other devices. Watch as the, the attack moved through your network that, that east to west traffic is so important when you're trying to figure out the complete extent of an event that has occurred. So what does this mean in the real world? Um, we'll, 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 there, I'm gonna prepare you, there's gonna be a poll here in a second, but uh, that's gonna be the poll question so you can be thinking about it. Um, and, and I hope you know that this is an email that you've probably seen before. You know, it's coming from the IT department and it says it's come to our attention that 33 devices on the medical VLAN are running Windows ME. Uh, extended support for Windows ME ended July 11th, 2006. Per policy, only devices with supported operating systems are allowed on the network. My manager has given me 30 days to resolve this issue. The 33 devices must be removed from the network, upgraded, or isolated immediately. Please let me know how you'd like to proceed. And I'd ask that the poll be put up now. Oh, well, maybe we won't be doing a poll. Oh, there we go. We're open. Yes, we are open now for that poll. Just let me know when you'd like for me to take it down and send you the results. You could answer, we'll give it another uh, about 15 seconds or so. All right, that's great. I think we should have had a chance to, to, to answer. Um, and. Okay. Uh, Bear with me for just a moment. Nope, you're fine. Perfect. All right. So we'll, we can revisit that uh, later. But so, so in, well, let's talk real world. Um, you know, and I don't know how you've answered the question. The polls are not at this point in time, but. In most situations, you're you're not going to be able to identify those 33 devices just by knowing that they're medical devices running Windows ME. So with that, let's let's take a look at how this could play out in real life. So this is order. Um, it's just, you know it's who I work for. I'm going to be completely transparent. There are other solutions that, that can do the same thing. I'm going to show you how we do it. Um, this is our HTM persona, which is limited to only medical devices. It's really de de designed around HTM professionals. Uh, and being able to quickly get in here, look at what you need, and then get out because there's so much other stuff you have to do in your day uh, than, than locate devices, uh, look for security risks, and so forth. Um, so with that, we want to go to our device view, and, and we have two pieces of information at this point in time. We know that it's a medical device. We've limited it to what we're searching for to only medical devices, and we know it's running Windows ME. So let's come in and see what we can find. We come over to operating systems, we can come down and go down to our windows and we can say Windows ME and we're going to apply. And that gives us 53 devices. Um, you can see some of these devices don't have models, um, but they all appear to have a manufacturer. 
Um, so with that, let's look at the manufacturers. And our two options are VMware, which doesn't sound like a medical device to me. Sometimes like something IT should be addressing. And GE. Well, that's definitely a medical device. So now if we look at GE and apply that filter, we're now down to our 33 devices that were referenced in the email. So we have 33 Precision 500Ds on the network that are all running Windows ME. Now, 33, one device seems a little unrealistic. If you're a large IDN, this is a complete possibility. One to two fluoroscopy machines across 24 hospitals that were all purchased around the same time with a bulk buy. You could end up with a lot of devices running outdated operating systems that all need to be replaced at the same time. So let's talk about that. What are our options here? So we have a couple options. We can remove the devices from the network. It's not really feasible. The, you know, it's, it's a fluoroscopy machine. It requires that it be connected to the network to send images to PACs so that physicians can do their job, and radiologists can do their job, and that information can be stored in that patient record. So although the device could function independently, it doesn't make much sense just to pull it off the network. We can upgrade the units. GE offers an upgrade for the Precision 500 and it gets you a Windows XP. Does not solve our problem. Still an unsupported operating system and doesn't seem like money well spent. And then we could replace the units. Uh, I don't know if anyone shopped for a, a fluoroscopy unit recently, but, but at the, on the low end for one with an overhead tube system, you're looking at about $550,000 plus so about 550K minimum to Re redo the room, do the wiring, do the electrical, and so forth. So you're looking at 600,000 times 33 devices, and you're, you're almost to $20 million to replace those, those devices. I don't think any organization is going to do that. Um, you may start a process to replace them over time and, and kick off that, that, that capital process, but you're not going to replace them all at once, not to mention it's going to take time to do that. So option four is, is to isolate and segment these devices using you know, kind of a zero trust uh, NAC type concept for that. So let's see what that would look like. So we've, we've looked at our devices. Let's dig down to one device. We'll pick the top one here. We have all of our great information about this device, but we also have the information about what this device is doing. So this device only has three communication patterns. It communicates only with these three devices and it communicates with them only in the ways outlined here. So with that, we can build a policy that will segment this device. If we look at those flows in more of a, a textual uh, format here, we can see those flows, their outflows and you know, the ports they're communicating over. So with that, we're in the current HTM mode. So we can switch over to our security mode and take a look and see what we can do with those particular devices. So here's our flows. They've been baseline. We say these are the flows that we're expecting. And then we can say, let's make a policy around these flows. So with that, we can say, I want to create a policy that can be shared with my IT department around these three flows. And we hit apply, and we're gonna get this list of policies. Now. This is going to be the list for all vendors. All of the vendors you see here are supported and represented in this one document. So if you're not sure which tools your IT department has, but you know you have some tools uh, and that they can implement these policies with, you can take this, cut it to your clipboard, attach it to a, a, a document and send it, or just cut it and paste it directly into the email. And this will give the IT department almost anything they could need to implement this policy across multiple different levels, be it NAC, be it a firewall rule, be it at the actual switch itself. So you have option here is you can take this and you can do this 33 times, but that doesn't make sense. We're talking about simplifying network security, not having you rinse and repeat and do things over and over again. So with that, we can come back to that device and look at what the other 33 devices are doing. So if we look at it from a profile view, where we say, okay, we have these GE Precision 500Ds and we have 33 of them, 33 of them listed here, we can come in and say, well, what are all 33 of the devices doing? With that, we can see that this, there's, a, there's a flow genome of pattern for all of those devices. 
And we have about, I think, 11, yep, 11 flows here. So all these devices share 11 different communication patterns. It's not a huge amount. So what we can do is that same process we just did around one device, we can do it for multiple devices. So now we can look at all the flows that, are, that have been baselined for all 33 devices and go through the same process. Say, I want to allow all of these flows and then generate a policy. So now this policy you generated is not just covering one device, it's covering all 33 devices. What this would allow us to do is then respond to our IT department and let them know that, hey, we have a solution for you. John, thank you for your email. We've determined that the 33 devices running Windows ME are GE Precision 500D machines. As the devices are critical to patient care, you cannot remove them from the network. Replacing the devices would cost in excess of $19 million and would take a significant more time than the allotted 30 days. I've attached a segmentation policy and it's compatible with most major firewalls and NAC solutions. Please implement uh, which one best fits. Sincerely, Joe Biomed. So what we've done is looked at a problem, looked at the tools we had and the solution we had and come up with a solution that did not require us to take the equipment offline. It didn't require us to replace anything. We simply protected it by limiting its communication to only the devices that it has to communicate with. We've now created one additional problem. Joe and John are now best friends, which is something we really strive for between IT and HTM departments. Because when IT and HTM departments are communicating properly, everybody is better off and all of our devices are more secure. So with that, the next day you come in and uh, John has, has taken it upon himself to send you some more information about a device that you know, is now acting uh, inappropriately in the network. Uh, and I'm not gonna make you take a poll again, but based on the question here, I want you to think to yourself is if you got this email would you be able to figure out what that device is? So John, uh, Joe, thank you for being helpful yesterday. As usual, we have a pro new problem today. Security has detected malware activity coming from a device with a MAC address of, I'm not gonna read that one. Um, we, have, uh, we are unsure what the device is, uh, but it's on the medical VLAN. I, I have been instructed to block the port of this device. Uh, I'm concerned it could, be, uh, could affect patient care. Can you identify the device and determine if we can block it uh, until the situation is resolved? So we have a device that is on a medical VLAN, so probably a medical device, and we only have a MAC address. Um, so we'll look at that, and the first part of the MAC address is, is not very unique, but the last four digits are fairly unique, so we know we have a, a 1C colon D5. And with that information, let's jump over to our tool. Um, let's clear out what we did before. start our search filter over again. And we knew the end of that MAC address was 1C D5. So with that, we can come in and search for that part of the MAC address, 1C D5. And hopefully, it brings us down to one device. So what is this device? Let's look into it. This is a PIX. So it's, it's a, a central station used to monitor multiple rooms. Um, we, we know that just be based on knowing what the piece of medical device is. It's running Windows 7. Uh, so it's an unsupported operating system that could be vulnerable um, to, to an attack. Um, we, we know it's on the network. The last time you know, we've, we've seen it's been communicating somewhat recently. Um, but it, it has a security incident. So we can actually investigate that. And, and sure enough, they're, they're correct. They're, we see malware activity on this particular device. Um, we've seen some other different activity as well. It's reaching out to prohibited IPs, and then it's also letting us know that, you know, we have an outdated operating system. So what can we do here? You know, we, we, we do, we see this device. Uh, we know it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a, a monitoring station, so it's used for delivering patient care. Um, what do we do? Well, we don't know where it is necessarily at this time. We know, we know a roundabout location. Um, but we also have additional information. We're connected to our, our, our CMMS, and we can come in here and say, what information do we have about this device within our CMMS? So with that, we can click on that and look at the asset information for this device. 
um, and we can quickly determine that this particular device is in the ICU. Um, one of the most critical areas for the hospital to continue to be able to monitor the patients in bulk and not have to have you know someone monitoring each patient individually. So we can call up to the ICU and find out, hey, is this the only solution you have for this or are there multiple ways that you're monitoring patients? In most organizations, unless you're extremely large, you're gonna only have one central station for each patient. Some have redundancies if, if you want. But in this particular case, we only have this one device and we cannot take it offline. So what are we gonna do? Well, we know what this device is doing and we know how it is supposed to behave. We know what our normal behavior is here and we see some medium and high behavior that's outside of, of that norm. The same process we implemented to proactively uh, protect the, the Precision 500 devices, we can now use reactively to protect this device. So we can look at this information and see all the flows that we have baselined down here. And then our medium and high flows right here are you know, unable to be, we're saying no, these are not part of the baseline. So if we create a policy around just what we've baselined, it would look something like this. We would say we're going to allow all those baselines like we did before. And now we've created a policy that we can share with our IT department that says we're going to allow this device to continue to operate in the way it was intended and talk to what it should be talked to. But at the end, when we look at some of these policies, uh, I'm going to pick on Cisco ICE, we're going to deny any other types of communication. So we're saying this is normal but anything else we're going to deny. And we're gonna deny all of that malicious activity that we see coming in and out of that device and not allow it to communicate that way anymore. So we can do the exact same thing. We can cut this to a clipboard. We can attach it to our emails and send this out to our IT department to implement these policies. And the good thing about this is that we now have protected this device. It was seamless to the end user. They didn't know the event was occurring. Uh, they didn't know they were at risk and we've now protected the device and we've bought ourselves time to now take a, a new device and, and put together and configure a replacement that could be then put in place with minimal downtime. So now we've seen the way we can proactively and during an event, protect the device with just clicks and just knowing about the device and using the tools that our organizations already have to protect what we, you know, what we haven't seen in the past, but we can see now. So with that, we'll we'll email, uh, we'll we'll look at this problem just like like I ran through there. You know, our options were to remove the device from the network and physically block it. Um, the central station will no longer receive information on the patient monitor. So you'll have a central station that is pretty much useless at that point in time. It, it cannot receive the information that is supposed to be monitored from the patient, and then it cannot also can't reach out uh, to send that information to wherever it needs to go. Um, replace it with a spare if available, um, and, and that's a great solution, except uh, I don't know if you've ever had to configure one of these devices. They're not, they're not an off-the-shelf device. They have to be configured um, to work in the environment they're in. That takes a significant amount of time, um, and that would be all downtime while that device was off the, the network. And then option three was what we talked about, which was to isolate the, the particular parts of the communication the device is doing that are malicious, and then implement the solution that blocks only those. And yes, we send an email back to John. John, the device in question is a PIC-IX used for the ICU to monitor critical patients. Therefore, removing it from the network would create patient safety risk and, and lead to an incident. Uh, can you please implement the policy attached to isolate malicious communication while we work to configure a replacement device? Uh, once we have the unit swapped out, we will turn it over for analysis. I um, mean, that's a key part there, the, the, that you working with your IT department um, allows you to, to have this kind of two-pronged approach to this. Uh, in the past, you know, the, I've seen IT departments have a knee-jerk reaction and just pull that device off the network and then you're troubleshooting, why is this not working, what's going on? Um, but if we can communicate and create that partnership um, between the, the two somewhat siloed departments that, that we see in healthcare between IT and clinical engineering, we can have outcomes like this where both teams are working together um, to have a better outcome 
to ensure that, that the equipment that is needed to provide patient care is up and not just turned off, uh, you know, if, if something is going on. Um, but we also create a great relationship um, for the future. And yep, we just did it. We stopped malware. So with that, um, I wanted to leave some time. Uh, I think I've left a little too much time for questions and the answers. I hope some people have some questions uh, associated with what we just went over. Uh, if it's anything associated about, you know, anything you can or can't do within the product or anything we talked about or anything outside of what we talked about, uh, feel free to add those um, to the comments box. Thank you so much, Ben, for all of this valuable information. And as a reminder to our audience, if you have a question for Ben, please use the questions feature on your webinar dashboard. We do have a few questions that have come in already, so we'll start with those. The first one, Ben, is you mentioned retrospective security on one of your slides. What can be done to determine the extent of an event? Sure, uh, that's that's great. Um, I'll, I'll switch back over here just just for a visual here. Um, so the information that you see here gathered in the in the flow genome is is gathered over time. Um, so we're gathering stuff whether we know that it is uh, malicious or not, um, and we're keeping metadata around those flows. Um, so if an, an event is determined to have happened, either a, a known event or a zero day event, where we don't necessarily know that it's going on until a certain point in time. Um, you can actually take this data and look at it and, and analyze it over time and see where what devices are communicating with what other devices and watch the east-west traffic and the external traffic uh, to determine you know how the event took place where it started uh, what machines were affected and basically build a timeline around the event and how and what occurred um, the things that are captured you know when, when the first and last seen the communication what's talking to what can all give you a picture uh, retrospectively of what happened during that event um, it gives us a couple things there we can do we can we can look at how we can prevent it in the future for one um, and additionally we can look at what devices were affected and and what we need to focus on to remediate the issue at hand uh, without having to go around and look at every single device um, that, that may have been a potential uh, victim. All right, our next question is, with limited capital resources, should the security or lack of security of a product be a consider consideration when prioritizing replacement? Um, I, I, my opinion, and this is an opinion statement, but I, I was in capital procurement for a while. I think it 100% should be. Um, I, I think it should, when you're looking at, uh, we, there's very, we'll start with this, healthcare always has limited capital resources, and there's always more equipment that needs to be replaced um, than there's capital uh, available for. Um, and when you're looking at how to spend those capital dollars, um, you know, the, the the security of the device and the risk um, that you of the device and the risk tolerance of the organization um, should always be taken into account. Um, and those devices that, that have that higher risk, um, either be it PHI exposure or un, uh, outdated operating systems or, or a myriad of different things, um, sh that should be part of the decision making process when looking at replacing devices uh, and prioritizing where those capital dollars should be spent. Right, this question came in early on, so I'm hoping that you recognize the acronym. Okay. Um, the question is, what is SCE on the list from early on in your presentation? And then a follow-up question to that says, it seems to be an agent or sensor. Okay, so uh, I, I'm, I'm going off, I don't know, which slide it was on. Um, so SCE in, in order terms is the systems control engine. It's kind of the brains of what we do. Um, so it is an, in, I, I'm, I'm sorry it was on the slide. It probably in this type of presentation shouldn't have been there, um, but it's the systems control engine. Uh, and what that is, is we bring all this metadata in and then the systems control engine is the one doing the analysis um, to see, you know, what traffic patterns are the, you know, the ones that are normal, uh, comparing that to what's happened before, what's happened, what we've seen across the industry from this particular type of device. Uh, so we're not just looking at what that device is doing, we're looking at what other like devices 
we've seen do and, and making sure that those are all acting within those same parameters. So from day one, when we see communication, we know if it's normal based on other devices we've seen and the systems control engine is what does that. Um, it is not an agent, it's, we were completely agentless. So we are only monitoring uh, the, the, the packets that are going across, we're doing deep packet inspection, we're decoding manufacturers' protocols to pull all of this information out from you know, the information about the device to the flows and so forth. Um, so SCE is a term we use for the, the system that does that work. All right, our next question is to detect malware, what type of method is being used, for example, such as yeah. knowledge-based or behavior-based? So it is kind of a combination of both. Um, we have um, a, a large knowledge base. We have, uh, I, I can't remember the names, but we use three separate threat feed uh, information that feeds us information that says, hey, if it's reaching out to this IP address, this uh, um, you know, URL, uh, that, that, that is a, a known malware site. Um, but then we also do behavioral analytics in that, you know, by baselining the device, we say this is the typical behavior of this device. And if it deviates from that baseline, we're also going to flag that as a, a possible uh, malicious uh, communication. So, and we're going to rate those accordingly. Uh, a behavior violation that is not on one of those threat feeds uh, is going to be a low. But then, you know, obviously, if it's on the threat feed or it's a known uh, bad site that it's reaching out to, um, we're going to escalate that uh, based on the, the risk uh, from the, that we get in from those threat feeds. Hopefully, I answered that question. Uh, I believe you did. So thank you very much, Ben, for your time today and for a great presentation. I would like to encourage everyone to visit our sponsor to learn more about the services they provide to our industry. Please visit order.net. A quick reminder that you can obtain your continuing education certificate by completing today's post-webinar survey. The survey will be emailed one hour after the end of today's webinar. You must complete the survey to receive your one continuing education credit from the ACI. You'll be able to download that certificate directly from your computer once you submit the survey. If you have any questions, you can reach us at webinar at mdpublishing.com. We will be back next week with another webinar. Please visit webinarwednesday.live for more details and complimentary registration. Thank you all and have a great afternoon.